everybody has to eat, right? Hopefully three times a day, mm-hmm. seven days a week, uh, we, we must eat. And that's a mandatory exercise as much as, as breathing and sleeping and all these things. So when you start to think objectively, like step back, like where is this food going to come from? Aren't there people out there that really care mm-hmm. about, you know, the environment, about animal welfare, about sustainable wages? about beautiful views, you know, you know, give me a hundred different customers. I'll give you a hundred different good reasons uh, why this farming matters. Welcome to the Wise Traditions Podcast, sponsored by the Weston A. Price Foundation for Wise Traditions and Food Farming and the Healing Arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. your host, Hilda Labrada gore This is episode 99, and my guest, wait, did I just say that? Yes, it's episode 99. You guys, the show has been on the air, out there on the internet since 2016, and we're so excited. I'll try to get back to the script. But the point is, next week is going to be the 100th episode, so you have to listen as we do a lovely Q&A with Sally fallon Morell, the head of the Weston A. Price Foundation. But for now, yes, this is episode 99, and my guest is Forrest Pritchard. He is a full-time farmer and a New York Times bestselling author. You heard me right. Forrest runs his own farm, Smith Meadows, in the Shenandoah Valley, while writing books at the same time. He is the author of Gaining Ground and Growing Tomorrow. Forrest has degrees in English and geology from William & Mary. In this episode, His Way with Words shines. You will be riveted as he describes simply and eloquently what today's farmers face how he began farming following current conventional methods, and what first steps we all can take to become reacquainted with and connected to our food sources and the land. We'll queue up the conversation in just a moment, but first we want to acknowledge our sponsors. As always, we want to thank the Weston A. Price Foundation because they are a member-supported organization that is behind this podcast. If you love what the foundation is doing, including this show, go to their website and click on the button that says, support our many projects. And there you can make a donation of any size. Thank you. Also, we are super excited for the upcoming conference, November 10th to the 13th. If you want to join us, just go to wisetraditions.org for details. Please come on out. You'll get to hear a lot of the speakers we've had on this show and get to connect with all of us personally. Welcome to Wise Traditions Forest. Hey, thanks. Big fan of the Weston A. Price Foundation for many, many years. Awesome. First, I have to say, I love your name. Thank my parents for uh, supplying not only a far- farmerly name, but one that translates to writing pretty well. So. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Well, it's just nicely syllabicated. You know, it's got that, that uh, two syllables on the front end, two syllables on the back end. It just presents nicely. It does. But I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> you were on the receiving end. Exactly. Like all good gifts. Well, I wanted to ask you, Forrest, right off the bat, when you were writing your book, Growing Tomorrow, you featured a lot of farmers and farms all over the place. And I wondered if you had one that you went to and you thought, oh, no, this is not what I thought it was going to be. It's not sustainable. It's not regenerative. I can't feature this one. Uh, Did that happen to you on your little tour of farms? No, that's a wonderful question, something something no one's asked me before. So when I was researching those farms, I was traveling around with, with Molly Peterson, who's a wonderful farmer and incredible photographer, um, obviously. And we would have that question. We'd say, you know, we're about to get on a plane and fly into, you know, I won't name any specific farms. I'll say Idaho or, you know, <laughs> Nebraska, places, places we didn't go. So I don't pigeonhole some farmer that's in the book. Um, <laughs> And say, look, we're going to be here for three days. What happens if we show up and they weren't representative of the words on their website or, you know, the, the brief phone interviews that we conducted? What do we do then? And the fact emerged that not only were the these 18 farmers completely different farmers from all corners of the country doing, you know, young, old men, women, you, you name it. Mm-hmm. Not only did they turn out to be representative of, of how they purported themselves, usually we, they exceeded our expectation, uh, mm-hmm. frankly. So I was grateful for that, but certainly I had that question very much in the front of my mind as I pursued that as well. Well, what a relief, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I think to kind of springboard off of that, that was no accident that that happened because having been a, a farmer who who's part of that peer group, you know, I attend farmer's markets for a living in D.C. I do six farmer's markets every weekend, 52 weeks a year. You get surrounded by a kind of like a, you know, kind of like an ambiance or like a uh, like an aura of how you must manifest yourself, you know, to live this kind of life, uh, the mm-hmm. hard work, the authenticity, et cetera. That translated through like the language that I got from these folks from a distance even. Mm-hmm. And that's in, that's in like stark contrast of like, you know, what I think we're seeing now, which is like a big machine moving towards like, you know, grass fed meats or, you know, free range this or, uh, you know, all natural that which is just a different energy entirely. It's a different brand. It's a different uh, language than really the simplistic uh, language that I was getting. Uh, the simple, but like, but genuine and sincere language that I was getting from this peer group that turned out to be a national peer group. For our listeners, we are all looking for that very aura you were talking about. We are looking for that authentic yeah. farmer that gets it, that is working hard and, you know, really trying to produce something that is valuable for the consumer, but also that's helpful for the land and the animals. How can we sniff out, so to speak, those who are inauthentic, who are using the right language, but aren't really living the kind of regenerative lifestyle that we're looking for? Yeah, these are incredibly important questions. And the first thing I would say is there's no shortcut. Okay. You know, much like you said to begin with, like I got a gift of just like something as simple as a name. You know, we have the opportunity to get to gift ourselves good food, nutritious food. We have the ability to gift ourselves the ability to pay our local economies uh, sustainable wages. Um, But that doesn't happen by accident. That happens with due diligence. Uh, Like anything good in life, you know, if we're going to create like a, a gift that's meaningful and enduring and sustainable, we have to go out and actually visit those farms. We have to have the conversations with these farmers and we have to educate ourselves. You know, I think it's really easy to, you know, become overnight experts on nutrition and agriculture and health and all these things and say, you know, I read a couple blog posts and all of a sudden, you know, I know I just need to drink bone broth and all my problems will be magically solved, <laughs> you know, uh, just to pick a, pick a subject out yeah. of the hat. It goes a little bit more deeply than that. We need to understand that we're getting true nutrition from this food. And that starts with soil. It starts with long-term practices. It starts with working with a farmer. By the way, if you're not growing this food yourself, which I'm sure some of your listeners do, Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it, it takes a greater depth to understand that that farmer has the vision of saying like these aren't like quick fixes. This is a long-term dedication to improving soil health, to increasing mineralogy in our soil and passing that through the animal so we get, you know, true, dense, diverse nutrition. Like I said to begin with, there's no shortcut, there's no silver bullet, there's no there's no panacea. And I know your listeners get that, or they wouldn't be listening to uh, you know, the Wise Traditions podcast to begin with. But you know what? I feel like our whole society is addicted to quick fixes to what's convenient. And even we in this kind of slow food movement are wanting just a quick answer. What, As a matter of fact, at the end of the episode, I will ask you what I ask all my guests, which is what is one thing the listener can do to improve their health? Because we just want something to kind of hang on to, but it's a complicated answer. Even the answer to that question is yeah. complicated, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll save that answer. If you, if you are going to ask me that, yeah, save end, it. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll save that answer because I think I got a decent one for that. <laughs> but I mean, just, just like, let's just look at the semantics of, of, the, of what we're talking about. Uh, you mentioned slow food. Slow food is what I just talked about. It is a meditative, contemplative vision. Then it's a practice. Okay. And those are all like really, you know, nice, like yoga words, you know, yeah. or like, you know, retreat words and stuff like that. And we can glaze <laughs> over it. But I mean, these are ancient traditions that we're talking about. The, the farmer's connection uh, to the soil, the shepherd's connection to the flock, the husbandry involved in understanding our microclimate, the understanding the depletion of our soil, because our soils have been so, especially here on the East Coast, where I'm, I'm in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, mm-hmm. uh, our soils have been depleted for centuries. And there's no quick fix for that. You don't fix that with, with buying a truckload of nitrogen or phosphorus or, you know, or God forbid, uh, you know, spraying it all with herbicide and, and, and planting a GMO crop. These are long-term problems that are going to require long-term solutions. And it's really tempting 
to, and I guess it is possible, you know, to go to a farmer's market or go to, you know, your buying club or whatever and get nutritious, dense, healthy food. But to expect that as a society, you know, when 96% of our food system is geared towards corn, soybeans, wheat, confinement, animal uh, livestock operations, that's that's naive, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, just to be straight shooting on that, to expect that all this food will either arrive or be available overnight, or that these solutions are just going to resolve themselves in the mat- in a matter of, of years, um, not decades or, or generations. Yeah, it's a heavy subject. And one thing that occurs to yeah. me just now, an illustration of it from the consumer's point of view is, I can buy a pair of jeans from H&M, or yeah. I can buy a pair of jeans from a high-end designer and I can't even name one because I don't I don't buy those jeans. But the, sure. the point is they look the same. But if I'm thinking the ones from H&M are going to be the same quality as the one that cost $400, I'm very mistaken. But from the outside, on a superficial level, they're both dark blue, you know, they got the acid wash or what have you, a couple of designer rips, you know. But they're different yeah. in terms of how long they're going to last and how they're going to serve me. So in the same yeah. way, you're right, we're fooling ourselves if we think that – Really nutrient-dense food can be bought at a large-scale industrial organic store, for example. Yes, absolutely. And uh, there's a price-value disconnect everywhere in our society. You know, why Why do we make fun of a, a farmer driving a beat-up pickup truck, and yet we ooh and ah over a Lamborghini that drives by? Mm. You know, uh, they're both going to get us to, you know, wherever we need to go, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, but we, we value, we place such value in such strange places. And, you know, I think a really easy takeaway for, you know, the food price value equation is the consequences, you know, the rise of type 2 diabetes, the rise of uh, childhood obesity, uh, the rise of, uh, you know, heart disease. These are like tangible takeaways that didn't exist. Like these problems, these conditions weren't existing, you know, when we were eating a more all natural diet, Mm -hmm. you know, the 1930s, 1940s, rise of cancer. So, you know, you name it, we can go, go down the list. Mm-hmm. And these are all like problems that don't manifest themselves overnight. These are like the accumulation of, you know, eating, you know, a thousand chicken sandwiches or, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, all, all the all the high fructose corn syrup getting Coca-Colas or whatever. So, yeah, not to throw stones or you know, to say like er- everything is lost. No. Um, but the, the solutions are long term and our devotion to changing our own eating habits is also must be long term. Well, that's why I liked your Growing Tomorrow book, because you are showing us glimmers of hope from people who are committed to these long-term solutions, and they know they're not quick fixes, and they're rolling up their sleeves and doing something about it. Right. And, And all these folks in Growing Tomorrow are devoted to essentially community service, right, to supporting their, you know, fellow women and men with, like, the promise of nutritious food. Um, and then relying on those customers to take the baton at that point. Say, look, mm-hmm. we're going to do the faith-based, you know, uh, volunteer uh, thing of being a farmer, right? Mm-hmm. You know, there's no, there's no corporation for farmers. Like, this is a volunteer effort. Yeah, yes, it's profit-driven, mm-hmm. <laughs> ideally. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> but there's people out there that sign up for the work of farming, and it's very, you know, mind-boggling when you when you sit back and think about it objectively compared to practically every other job that's out there in the world. Um, but these folks sign up for this, grow this food, and then rely upon the customers to, you know, quote unquote, to get it, right? Yeah. To understand it, to, to, to support it. And if they don't, then these folks don't stay in business and they go get, you know, an office job but like the rest of the world. Coming up, Forrest tells us what made him take this volunteer farming position when he had a host of other possibilities in front of him. Hey, and we want to draw your attention to two things quickly. First, we have a survey on the website, westonaprice.org, and we want your feedback. It's all about the podcast. What do you love about it? What can we improve? What topics do you want covered in the future? We want to connect with you. So go to the site, click on the button that says take our podcast survey. It's on the homepage. And then also while you're at it, you might want to give a donation to the foundation. You know, they are a membership-driven organization. They need all the help they can get. So please support our many projects by giving just even $10 toward this podcast effort and other initiatives. 
Hey, so I've told a bunch of you about the Wise Traditions Conference in November in Minneapolis, and I know it's going to be awesome, but I want you to hear about it from a friend. So today I've invited Sandrine Perez, who leads Nourishing Our Children and serves as a chapter leader in Portland, Oregon, to tell us a little bit about what she loves about the Wise Traditions Conference. Hey, Sandrine. Hi, Hilda. I love to tell people about what I love about the conference because I have been going year after year. I started in 2004, and this next conference will be my 13th conference. So clearly, I really do love it. And I'll say first and foremost, what I love is the people. I have made lifelong friendships, And I so look forward to seeing people year after year. It's like a large family reunion. And the first day is just hugs and kisses and reconnections. And I'm just overjoyed to be with my tribe. That's (laughs) awesome. um, So first and foremost, I keep going back because of the people. So connection and community and friendship is at the top of my list. And then, you know, Hilda, another reason I keep going back is every year um, they offer new presentations and new speakers, and I just continue to learn. So lifelong education is right there as well. Um, it's such a good opportunity for me to sort of keep up with what's happening in our in our larger community. And your podcasts help me do that, too. So I want to thank you for that. So, uh, but the conference, you know, so offers me that opportunity to also ask questions and go a bit more in depth. Mm -hmm. And then really also the experience of eating according to our wise traditions diet to, you know, eating according to these dietary principles, eating in community this way, where I can be at a large hotel and eat the kind of meal I would prepare for myself at home without having to ask, you know, what are the resource, what, how has it been sourced? I'm not concerned about whether it's food that I would source for myself. I know that it's going to be um, high quality and that it'll nourish me. And to be in a public place for so many days and not have to cook and not have to be concerned at all about the the food is just a luxury and just a really great gift that I give myself every year. (laughs) I love it. You are so right. It's community, connection, food. These are things we actually offer. Well, we don't offer the food, but we can only offer to a degree through the show. So I'm really hoping people will take to heart what you're saying and come meet us and be all together in family and person, like you're saying. Yes. And... I'm really deeply committed to these principles and I don't have that many opportunities to be with other people who are so like-minded. For me, when I sit at a table at the conference, people there care about what they're eating. And so I really like that sense of shared reality, you know, Mm -hmm. it's like it normalizes my life to be with people who also really care about nutrition and their well-being and their wholeness and so I, I just love that sense of normalization. You're Do you with know what people, I'm saying? <laughs> yes, you're with people who get it, right? You're with people who get it and understand the importance of nourishing ourselves well. And yes. it's yes. fantastic. There's nothing like it. You know, Hilda, I also want to be sure to add that every time I go to the conference, it's like a brand new experience. Of course, some elements are familiar to me, but the people are new. I'm meeting new people. The food is unique each and every time. And the speakers and the topics are largely new each time. So one of the reasons I keep going back is because it's a whole new experience. And I really look forward to expanding beyond the last experience and having new adventure. Well, Sandrine, thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to the conference and to connecting with you and so many others who are in this tribe, as you said. What made you take this quote unquote volunteer position when you could have just had a regular job? Tell us a little bit of your story, Forrest. Well, that's kind of you to ask. So I'm technically a seventh generation farmer, but unlike the way most people expect, like my dad wasn't a farmer. Uh, My dad was a a government employee in D.C. and my mom, uh, you know, made, made ends meet by selling houses out here in our rural Virginia, West Virginia community. Mm -hmm. Um, So my granddad was the last one to really farm. And in between, like my parents had to work full-time off-farm jobs to to have the land kind of hang on. And so when I was in high school, I was in college, I saw like the strong legacy 
that my grandparents had provided uh, to wit. You know, you mentioned I went to William and Mary, which you, it's commonly thought of as a you know really rich private school. It's actually a public school mm-hmm. in Virginia. But that being said, even then, tuition was like, you know, $8,000 a year. And our farm from, you know, 1980s, 1990s was losing, you know, 50000 to to $100,000 a year. Wow. So there wasn't even money for, for a college education, um, except that my grandparents had farmed for 60 years. And they made the promise to put all their grandchildren uh, through college, uh-huh. uh, which is incredible. It's an incredible gift, yeah. right? Um. So even though my parents were struggling with off-farm jobs just to hold on to the farm, my grandparents gave me this gift of education. Hmm. So I had like kind of like competing realities. Like I had this like past reality of like, hey, my grandparents did it and I'm like the legacy of that. And yet in real time, my parents are like struggling, like taking every dollar that they're making from their paychecks and then it's like dumping it into the farm just to hang on. Mm-hmm. So I said, what, what do I do with this? So yeah, I came back to the farm and, and did what I thought was right, which was listen to my major land grant institutions in the form of Virginia Tech and West Virginia University and Penn State. And they said, take all these, you know, take all your grasslands and, and herbicide them off because the only way to really make money is to plant corn and soybean. Mm. And not knowing like knowing that I didn't know what to do, I followed their advice because that's the wise thing apparently yeah. to have done. And I collaborated with a local farmer who also knew what he was doing. I used his, we collaborated on machinery and, and expertise and all this stuff. And long story short, in 1996, we planted this crop of, of corn and soybean and sent five tractor trailer loads of grain down the road. And I said, my gosh, we're going to, you know, make you know, X number of dollars. And when all the numbers came through, we knew we needed to make $10,000 in uh-huh. order just to pay our bills. And the farmer came up and said, uh, you know, well, we didn't make $10,000. We didn't make $8,000. We made eighteen sixteen. And I remember my mom saying, well, goodness, $1,800, yeah. $1,816 is a long way from 10000 And he, he turned red and said, we didn't make $1,816. We made $18.16. Oh my goodness. Which... <sighs> was devastating. Yeah. You know, I, I felt, I felt my knees go soft at that point. Like, what am I going to do with $20, $20 for a year's worth of work? Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of where, where my story starts um, with these different legacies with the contemporary reality and then the knowledge that I had to radically change. So that was all 21 years ago. And I went into grass based sustainable livestock mm-hmm. uh, from that point. And I mean, honestly, in my opinion, things just get better, better and better year after year. And what was a turning point for you to realize, well, obviously the 1816 was significant, but like what made you realize, oh my gosh, this also isn't good for the land or for me or for anything or for the economy? Well, that's a wonderful question. Um, And I think that's a really psychological question, obviously, because you're asking like, how do I feel? Yeah. Uh, You know, how did that impact me on kind of like a psychic level? Um, And I could see that answer written on the faces of other farmers around here. Uh, I didn't have to look in the mirror for that. I could see that other farmers were discouraged, that there was very little hope in ever making like a genuine profit from the economic sustainability standpoint, much less the environmental sustainability was less of a consideration than some kind Mm -hmm. of like economic perpetuation, in other words, a profit. But especially like all those farmers were older, you know, in their mid forties at the youngest, Uh, we're talking like 50s, 60s, 70s. And my peer group, when I was 21, 22, whatever was written on the faces of those older farmers was very much reflected in the backs, in the backs being turned uh, of my generation, my generation uh, turned turn their back. Yeah, that's right. And so body language was really coming and going. And the proof is is self evident right now. The average age of the American farmers fifty eight, fifty nine years old. You know, I could go on and on. Right. You were seeing the future, and it wasn't looking pretty in terms of people who were farming the land conventionally were unhappy. Nobody was turning a profit, and so like yeah. everything started clicking for you. There's no young people in this. What's happening? Right. You probably started assessing the scene. Yeah, that becomes a mindset. Do you fall into the bias of this is how things are and this is the way it is and, and that's just all there is to it? Or or are you of a mindset where, uh, you know, John Lennon famously said, uh, there's no, no problems, only solutions, right? Uh-huh. Um, so do you view this through a lens of opportunity? And how do you take an opportunity of saying like, my God, the landscape is now of 
is herbicides and pesticides and commercial fertilizers and confinement feedlots. And he used the word earlier, he said, you know, how do you sniff out a farm that does the right things? Well, you can literally use your nose. Um, if, if, if something <laughs> smells bad, like things in nature are not supposed to smell bad unless you're standing like, you know, right next to an animal. It's like doing its business, you know. Right. Nature has uh, these natural balancing mechanisms. So to get back to the idea of like figuring out an opportunity amongst all this can seem very challenging. Yeah. Except when you think everybody has to eat, hopefully three times a day, mm-hmm. seven days a week, uh, we, we must eat. Um, and that's a mandatory exercise as much as, as breathing and sleeping and, and all these things. So when you start to think objectively, like step back, like where is this food going to come from? Aren't there people out there that really care mm-hmm. about, you know, the environment, about animal welfare, about sustainable wages, about beautiful views? You know, you know, give me a hundred different customers. I'll give you a hundred different good reasons uh, why this farming matters to a hundred different people. And I said, well, of course there must be, you know, there's, 360 million people in the United States, there's got to be enough out here to support my farm. So that's kind of the philosophy that I went with, which was like kind of like birds of a feather, like attracts like, uh, you put out positive energy, you get positive energy. Yeah. And, and my gosh, it's worked. It's an effective way to think. I love it. And it reminds me of some things Joel Salatin has said about how there's kind of beauty and sensuality and really uh-huh. joy in a farm that's well run in this manner. There's nothing I can say that Joel Salton can't say uh, better. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's a one, wonderful ambassador uh, for this movement. And, you know, that being said, uh, for, like when I think about like trying to translate this into writing, yeah. um, I go back to, I always go back to like Walt Whitman mm-hmm. with Leaves of Grass. I've heard of the book Leaves of Grass that everybody yeah. like attended Walt Whitman Middle School or, or played at Walt Whitman Park. There's a reason this guy is like super famous, right? <laughs> and and I think he's underappreciated in a certain way Joel Salatin is too. But what is the title of this book? It's called Leaves of Grass. Like this guy was a pasture poet <laughs> like 150 years ago. Mm-hmm. Like he was getting the mission of the cycle of life and sustainability and all these things. So Walt Whitman wasn't a grass farmer, but he was our first grass poet. <laughs> putting that on record. <laughs> I first like time that. Right here. So I want to ask you, how did you, I'm pivoting a little bit here. I want to ask you, how did you return the soil to fertility after having followed some conventional methods? Did that take time too? Oh, all the time you can give it. All the time you can give it. You know, I tell people all the time that come to the farm, I hope, you know, if I'm, if I'm lucky enough to live to be 80 or 90 years old, I hope by that point, I'll begin to have a glimpse of what true fertility looks like. Because I think here in the Shenandoah Valley, we don't really know. Our soils are so depleted of, mm-hmm. of macro, not only macronutrients, but especially micronutrients, mm-hmm. you know, seleniums and, and, and boron and, and, and cobalt and all these things that are the building blocks of, of uh, either building blocks of plants or the, or the chemical facilitators that allow us to unlock you know, the macronutrients, the, the calciums and the nitrogens and things like that. How do you do that? You do that with, with great intentionality. And, and devotion and, and vision. And I'll give you a concrete example. The rise of not only rotational grazing, uh-huh. uh, but mob grazing in particular, has been a way that we can accelerate the rebuilding of our soils. And I'll be more specific about that. So if anybody's seen Dances with Wolves, yeah. pretty, pretty good movie. But there's a wonderful scene where the Native American tribe is looking for the buffalo. And Kevin Costner finds the buffalo. He says, Tatanka, right? He's like, I found Tatanka. I found Tatanka. How'd you find them? And there's a wonderful scene where they go up over a hill and they look, and there's just a highway of trampled grass. Okay? Uh-huh. And why is that happening? Because the buffalo are moving in herds. And whether it's, it's well, like the pressure of wolves or yeah. the pressure of, of native tribes, uh, the, the buffalo know that they're prey. Okay? Intuitively. And so they stay in a group. They take a bite of grass. They trample and they poop and they pee over it. Yeah. And then they don't stay in one place. They move, they move, they move. And we can mimic that same behavior uh, with livestock. Uh, we can do that with cattle by using uh, temporary fences. You, you, take the, you go in ahead of the cattle, you, you identify you know, how much grass or pasture, I'm talking like diverse legumes and you know, weeds and all, all the good stuff. Uh-huh. And you subdivide that. You put the cattle in there for a short time frame, talking like eight hours to mimic what they would do in the wild, which right. is stay clustered, stay tight, take an opportunistic bite. And then we as managers move them and then we rest that soil. So it's covered in biomass, AKA 
you know, grass and, and vegetative matter. Mm -hmm. They take a bite, they get the nutrition that they need, they trample the heck out of it, they poop all over it. You know, it looks like the world's worst frat party, uh, <laughs> you know, the day after, minus the beer cans and pizza boxes. But you get the idea. And then you allow that system to recuperate, uh, allow the soil microbiology, the molds, the fungi, the bacteria, the invertebrates, the beetles, the birds that come in and scratch through the manure to recover. And you repeat that every 50, 60, 70 days. You give it long rest periods and, uh, and the ground really responds. It really responds. You know, it's a lot easier than allowing a forest to build leaf matter, you know, one fraction of a centimeter per year or whatever that rate is. Right, right. It reminds me of, um, I interviewed Sarah Savory, Alan Savory's daughter, mm. and I think she started an organization called Harnessing Hooves. And basically, that's what you're doing. You're using the animals, and, and not, I don't want to say using, but, you know, allowing yeah. them to move and fertilize and, and revive the land in a way that is very much cooperating with nature and is beneficial to all. Exactly. And, you know, you use the right verb in use. Uh, this is a relationship. These are ancient, ancient relationships, the shepherd and his flock and the animal husband uh, with, with his herds. This is like a devotional, in, intentional, you know, opportunity. And it's not just in livestock, which is really exciting. This is all, this is translatable into, uh, you know, composting systems, different systems with vegetables, certainly with orchard orcharding and uh, like a mushroom farm that I visited, you know, outside of St. Louis, you uh -huh. know, all these solutions are translatable and scalable, almost irrespective of what the, uh, what the ultimate food is going to be. Oh my gosh, this is so fascinating. And what I think we're going to have to do, Forrest, is a part two, because I want to hear more about how, yeah, people are applying these methods to restore yeah. the earth and to benefit those of us who want to eat that nutrient-dense food. Um, but we're going to have to wrap up right now. And so I want to ask you the final question, which is, if the listener could only do one thing to improve their health, what would you recommend that they do? I think that's an incredibly important question. And uh, the best advice I can give anybody is to, is to grow some of your own food. Plant a tomato, plant some basil, either in your apartment or your condo in a window box, in outside your house in a raised bed, if you're in the city, uh, in a community garden. Participate in the active you know, ritual, for lack of a better word, or probably appropriate word, of growing your own food. The taste of it, the feel of it, the smell of it the failure of it, the difficulty of it, the disappointment of it, mm -hmm. of, of, of having something not turn out the way you want it to, the sublime satisfaction of having it turn out far better than you ever imagined. You know, ride that spectrum of growing a living plant and then take the rewards of it yeah. uh, right onto your plate, into the taste of it. I think that's a disconnect that over the generations that we've lost, it went from us growing our own food to gran to grandpa growing the food to, oh, I remember people talking about grandpa growing the food, <laughs> you know? So if we can reconnect with that, I think all the, uh, all the puzzle pieces uh, kind of fall back into place. I love that, Forrest. Thank you so much for your time today. This has been a valuable conversation. I know it's going to be of benefit and kind of a reward for the listeners. So thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. And thanks for the good work you guys are doing at Weston A. Price. My guest today was Forrest Pritchard. For more on Forrest and all that he is doing, go to his website, ForrestPritchard.com. That's Forrest with two R's and Pritchard, P-R-I-T-C-H-A-R-D. It might be just easier if you go to the WestonAPrice.org website, click on the tab for blogs and podcasts, and find the show notes for this episode 99. Hey, and a big thank you to Podcast Village. Charlie Burney is my good friend and the head of Podcast Village. He has his friend Joe and Sarah working with him. It's just a great team who helps everybody produce and promote their own shows. So check them out at PodcastVillage.com. And a thank you to my intern, Cynthia Castro, for her help with the show notes. Hey, if you want to get in touch with me, you know, go to HolisticHilda.com or follow me on social media. And don't forget to listen to our episode next week, number 100 with Sally Fallon Morrell. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, please share it with others. Post a link on Facebook or Twitter or send a link to a friend in an email or simply review Wise Traditions on iTunes. Sharing the podcast is one way to spread the important message of health through nutrition. Wise Traditions is brought to you by the Weston A. Price Foundation for Wise Traditions in Food Farming in the Healing Arts. 
The content of this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for medical advice.